This is Techie and the Biz, a podcast to explain and simplify how business technology is changing and why it can benefit your organization. Today, we're excited to be joined by one of the leading experts in mobile security from a brand you all know and love, from smart appliances to your favorite smartphones. Please welcome my go-to technologist and solution guru, HJ from Samsung Engineering. Welcome, HJ. Welcome. Thanks, Max. Happy Welcome. to be here. Can I can I put in a real quick plug because I, I love the podcast. <laughs> uh, Techie in the Biz. I, I watched a, a, a few of your, your videos. Are they're quite uh, in depth? But like everyone says, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and smash that alert. <laughs> that's great we love it yes that's awesome thank can, you can we use that sound bite and every time we shoot one of these i know i i love i i, I wanted to, the opportunity to be able to do that i mean i've been waiting for this moment for like two weeks now so I, this has been <laughs> thank you awesome. thanks for having me <laughs> to start us off can you give us a little background on how you got started in this industry and what led you to work in mobile technology at samsung engineering so let's it's quite interesting. Uh, I, I started off as as a uh, tester for for websites. I mean, this is going back to the dot com days, and and so it's been really exciting. It it sort of like landed here at Samsung. Uh, I did you know federal consulting, so I have a pretty pretty well in depth background in in terms of the you know security and what it takes. And I, I have a few stories to share about about that and the up, upcoming you know my upbringing there, and so. Uh, you know, I went into government consulting and then I was like, you know what, this mobile thing seems pretty interesting. So let me, let me try that out. And, you know, you know, things, things shifted and, and I was like, okay, so let, let me try that out. And I landed at Samsung because one, I love, love the products. I was using it on a daily basis, but then they started bringing out this Knox thing. And so I was really curious about that and, you know, curiosity got the cat. And uh, so, so I went from, from my government consulting, my development background, and, and all the way into where I am today at Samsung. That's great. So I wanted to share a story. I actually just came back from Las Vegas and experienced the impact of the recent cybersecurity hack that's been all over the news. Uh, from the moment that I entered my hotel room, I actually noticed the change or the impact of the hack. Uh, for example, the blinds in my room couldn't open since they worked off of a tablet system that was down. Um, and on the casino floor, funny enough, uh, I noticed the progressive jackpot slot machines like Wheel of Fortune, which is Erica's favorite, by the way, was offline. No, not Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> That's crazy. No, no, Wheel of Fortune? No yeah. sunshine? No, nothing. Was the was roulette tables running? Yes, roulette was a go. Uh, and I had some good luck there, but to bring us back on topic, this really highlighted the importance of security and especially relating to mobile devices. In fact, I think a simple password reset request to the IT help desk was how hackers gained access to all of MGM system in Vegas. So, so how does Samsung protect the end user from some of the most common hacks like weak or reused passwords? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, I, I, previously, Zach, we had on on the podcast, we talked about the weakest link, and it's always the weakest link that gets you in trouble. But at the same time, you have to think about uh, the balance between security protocol and the risk that you're willing to take versus uh, you know being able to innovate, and it's it's a really fine line, and it's it's hard to to understand that unless you're actually doing the implementation and the coding and to be able to you know, meet deadlines and things like that. These, these reuse passwords, these weak passwords that people are using, it, if you look at the charts, like uh, 11 character with special characters, with you know uppercase, lowercase, that can be cracked in three years, just three years time. So that's 11, that's just 11, right? Um, how many people have used password or one, two, three, four? Where do we? Everybody at some point, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or something that's really common to you that that's easy to remember. But if you look at it back in the day when, when the dot com was, was sort of growing up, 
we didn't have all of these different sites to actually create a user identity on. It was very simple. It was primarily just email, right? And maybe your instant messenger account, right? So it was very, very sort of localized. But as the internet grew and as, the, as you started to see all these new technologies, these great things like Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all that, you, it's like these plethora of, of applications, it started getting really hard. And so what people started to do was they started to reuse those pa same passwords because it was easy. Uh, it, people and humans are, are creatures of habit. So it's, let me just reuse that one because I know it's secure. So that sort of left the door open for again, hackers and to get a treasure trove of, okay, if I crack one, I just won that jackpot, right? And and so so what does Samsung do in in terms of of being able to uh, you know limit that? Well, there's a few things. So so Max, that have you ever connected to that free public Wi-Fi that was inside of the the casino? Like, well, well, first rule: don't connect to that during DefCon. That's rule number one. Right. <laughs> the other thing is protect yourself. And so so there's. Yeah, you know, how many times have you seen like an ad for like ExpressVPN on, on a YouTube video? Okay, there's there's reasons for it. Well, Samsung has created a a way, better way to help protect you on those those unsecured Wi-Fi, and so we we provide a VPN, a free VPN up to one gigabyte a month, just because we understand that users need that protection, but they but they need to know where to go find it. And, and so I think that's, that's the hard part is to try to educate and lead people to knowing that, okay, you know, you should be protecting yourself, encrypting all your data, regardless of whether you think it's safe or not, um, so that you're not compromised in any way. Okay, so, so definitely network-based security. What about features like uh, using biometrics versus using the actual password? That's something that could be sniffed on an unsecured network. Yeah, so biometrics is was was an interesting uh, addition over to to our platform and amongst the others that are out in the, the market space. The the thing about biometrics is it's it's that second form of authentication. It's multi-factor authentication. Now you can use biometrics, you can use that one-time pass key, you can even use text messages. Now, I'd argue that text messages is less secure, uh, given that there are there's these things called SIM hacking. That, that can happen where someone can overtake and, and basically replicate your IMEI in, in the market space. So the thing is like biometrics is really a physical way to authenticate yourself along with your password. Does that make you safe? It makes you safer, <laughs> but that doesn't protect what's happening on, on the corporate side behind where, where you're, you're, you're logging in. That's so much like how one of those password managers out there eventually uh, was compromised because it wasn't the two-factor part that, that was broken. It was an internal issue. Huh. I, if I may, I have two things to say about this. <laughs> First, as a person who is infamous for resetting my passwords to only eventually have to reset my password again, I just never realized that this was such a risk. It's, it's not normal, by the way. <laughs> and <laughs> second, based on your story, I just feel like with all this hacking and personal information, so much for the old saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> I guess they need a new tagline. I yeah. guess so. What happens in Vegas uh, goes on the dark web, apparently. It can. It can. And, and uh, you know, not that I'm commenting on it, but it, it will end up there. Um, and, and so if, if you're in technology and, and you can know, know how to traverse onion sites, you would, you would definitely know that at some point that data is going to be there. And, and that only adds to the information sort of, you know, bag of information that, that they can use to then further infiltrate other, other places because they have your personal data. They have personally identifiable data. Um, and, and so it's not necessarily attacking individuals. It's using that information for nefarious purposes. You know, I have, I always wonder, I mean, if we're not supposed to constantly use the same passwords, then I have so between my kids and myself and my family and my dogs and every app and every 
office that I have to have a portal for. I have to have a password. And it's like, I try to use different passwords, but this is why I tend to forget them. So what would you recommend someone do who has to have for just, you know, regular like life? Is there an easy button? Yeah. Like, a- what would you, re- what do you recommend? <laughs> there is, there is, or well, at least, at least for what works for me. So, uh, uh, and you know, I don't know if I've, I haven't been personally hacked, but, but I know like, you know, the dark web has some of the passwords that I've used. Um, it's all about creating patterns. Okay. So, so you, you know, that you have certain requirements about a special character, about uppercase and things like that. Um, think of things that, that you can use and, and just use a special character as the space. So, so ampersand, for instance, if you want to join up multiple, uh, a, a length, like, you know, the quick Brown Fox, for instance, right. Every space could be a special character. It could be the same special character, but it's just a special character. It, it, it just needs to be long enough. Right and have just the uppercase and lowercase, right? It just needs to be long enough. So uh, my work computer, I have a 15 character password minimum, okay? Yeah, like me. <laughs> my my password manager has 30. Wow. Okay, so so the thing is, but but it's all about what you can remember as a, as a pattern. So, um, you know, some people use like, something that that will remind you of the website that you're on or the app that you're using right that could be a partial a partial part of the key plus a password um sort of uh pattern that you're using um so like for instance like you could use colors uh and then but but how you sort of change change that out is that i usually just delineate by using the special characters um, that way I don't have to actually replace like a, like an A for, for like an at sign, for instance, cause, cause that can get, cause like you mm-hmm. might not remember what you thought of at the time, but if you use it within like your spaces, then, then it makes it a lot easier to remember. Um, and so, so yeah, but once, once I find out that that's been compromised, then, then what I up happening is then I'll have to come up with a new way to think about it. They, the way I look at it is that you just need to be one step ahead of, of the, the hackers. What's going to be interesting is that once AI comes into the picture, it's going to be really hard uh, to come up with, with a meaningful password that the, the AI engines won't come up with. And that's why the industry is moving from passwords to pass keys. Um, with biometrics, right? And that's that's where we're going with technology. Wow, that's interesting. That yeah, that definitely makes sense. I have to change my password at Mattel every three months, so I go through this exercise with all the requirements every Wait. three months. And yes, it, it, there months? there has to be a pattern. Otherwise, there's no way I'm going to remember <laughs> any of it. So, three months? That's you're you're okay, that, that, you're that's too easy. I have to pay. We have to change ours every thirty days. Oh wow. Oh wow. Yeah. That there's no way I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> if I had to do it every 30 days. You know, it's so crazy. I always think like when we were younger, we had to know our social security number. That was the big thing. And if you ask any anyone under the age of 30, they probably have to look look it up. I don't think most college students can just nope. rattle off their social security number. And then we had to add in like our ATM code, maybe, yeah. right? Like, our, And that was like it. And, that, you know, maybe our best friend's phone numbers. But now it's like, there's just so much. It's always so this is a good system to think of a pattern because there's just so much. Yeah. Even if you put it in a system or you write it down, there's just always so many things to remember. Do, do you know, in 1999, I had access to pretty much anyone that had a student loan. They're complete information, their name, their address, their loan amount, their social security number, and it was not encrypted. Wow. So so (laughs) we've come a long way in security. Yeah. Yeah. You you had a lot of friends back then would call you up and be like, hey, can you do me a solid and just change the balance due on that loan? (laughs) (laughs) Luckily, it was only a view only, but I I actually saw my parents. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So I had a plus loan. And I saw my parents' information in there. Like literally, it was like it wow. was it was it was it was quite <laughs> intense. Uh, you know. And then one time, I I uh, accidentally deleted all the data in production. Uh, no. so is that is that what we're going to call it? Accidentally? 
<laughs> yeah, well, well, they gave me the the root password, and so I I um, was trying to load in a test database, but I was in production instead, and I, I learned a lesson that yeah, always change the background whenever you're in production to like red, <laughs> and then you know <laughs> test stuff in green. So that that was back when I was I was doing quite a bit of programming, but these days I'm wow. doing a lot more sales engineering. Oh my gosh, that's a crazy story. <laughs> I like that background color. Yeah. Don't delete that one. <laughs> right. Basically, yeah. Warning. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I never realized how at risk I was for constantly resetting my passwords. <laughs> yeah, that's that. And in, in fact, that's that's how uh, sort of MGM was fished. Wow. Was was a password reset. Yeah. Wow. So so what ended up happening was they they got the two factor. And then once they got the two factor, then they can just say forgot password and they're right in. HJ, what about malicious software embedded in an app that we all download to our devices? So that's that's also another interesting point, right? Like uh, Samsung's approach, I'll, I'll give you sort of what, what Samsung does with this, is that we look at the mobile device and when you start bringing in biometrics, when you start bringing in those authenticator applications, it is a gold mine for that device for any malicious the actor that's out there. Okay. And so we take the approach of security first always, but we also want it to be in the background. So you don't notice it. It's kind of like having a bodyguard that walks around with you that, that nobody notices. And, and how we do that is through a few mechanisms. So we have what's known as Knox vault. There is within that, there is a secure processor. There is secure memory. There's a trust zone, there's real-time kernel protection. And so these are really technical things, but let me sort of, you know, make it easier for you to digest. What, what the Knox fault really is doing is that if you have an application that's running, it's sort of, it's going to be sandboxed so that only those processes and the execution time is locked down so that other applications can't inject themselves into it to give you bad results or to give you an output that that uh, you know you weren't expecting. The secure memory part is that a lot of times application developers, when they develop, some of the memory can just linger out on the chips because it just cuts that tie to the point where in where it is in memory. And so secure memory sandboxes it so that once a session is created. You do your processing, you save your memory, and that memory gets wiped out, right? So it's so it's protecting you from from an OS perspective because that's that's the big uh, thing that can sort of make make it easier for hackers to get in because that's running on top that has high level privileges. But what they're really trying to do is they're trying to get to that sensitive data that's stored within that trust zone area, the things like biometrics, the things like your secure passwords. That's what they're after. And so think about think about it this way. Like if you walked into a bank, okay, and you have a safe in the middle, you have the employees that are working, you have individuals coming in to do standard banking transactions, but you have one bad actor that, that comes in there that wants to steal all that money. That's that safe is Knox Vault. Okay. And so that protects the the contents, but you also have to worry about insider threats. So like employees who have access to that safe. And then you also have those external parties that also are um, you know, sort of walking around and, and trying to get your data. So, so, the, so we're looking at multiple different areas, attack vectors, and we're trying to solve that through hardware-based uh, principles and, and, and uh, techniques to sit, you know, keep that data safe. So if your OS gets compromised, and your OS then has access to the kernel, then your, your whole system is down. So that's what that real-time kernel protection is for, is so that we're constantly monitoring just to make sure that if that kernel gets modified in any way, we will wipe that, we'll wipe your device. That's what Knox is, is there for. It's in the background, you don't see it, but when, it, when something happens, that's, that's, that's when you're really gonna be like, thank goodness I have Knox Vault on my system. I love that. As many people know, I travel quite a bit. 
<laughs> and sometimes I do need to get on that free Wi-Fi network. Um, it's interesting that you said earlier that uh, Samsung offers the VPN access, but I was curious, we're, we're often warned against using free Wi-Fi. And most people associate that with like the free Wi-Fi at the local coffee shop. But then we go to a hotel, we spend hundreds of dollars for a night, we get on the Wi-Fi and we feel completely protected. In your experience, is, is that something that uh, end users need to worry about when they're on that hotel Wi-Fi network? They do. Um, it, there's a concept of Wi-Fi masquerading. So enterprise networks have a way to sniff out masqueraders that are out there. So if you see in certain cases, multiple instances, let's, let's use Starbucks as an example. If you have multiple Starbucks guest networks that are out there, that it could be that uh, it's part of a you know widely distributed network, or it could be someone who just brought up a hotspot. And, and so if you connect to that hotspot, they have full access to, to your system unless you have you know, built-in firewalls and things like that. Um, so, so you gotta be really careful in that sense. And that, that's where VPN helps to encrypt a lot of that data because from your endpoint, being the mobile device, connecting into an, a remote system. Um, now I wouldn't recommend, you know, checking your banking details while you're on that free Wi-Fi. <laughs> uh, you know, like, you know, it's, it's what is your risk tolerance, okay? So it's like, okay, is is Instagram like you know something I should access? Yep. Okay. I mean, you, it's good, but you know, don't, don't don't be you know use you know accessing credit card information or banking data you know on free Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, leave that at home, right? I mean, just use good security principles when when you're when you're out and about. I, I actually had an eye-opening experience at uh, a conference I went to a few years back when someone. Uh, everyone entered the room. The presenter, who was a cybersecurity specialist, had everyone, you know, kind of go on the Wi-Fi. And within minutes, he was showing us. He picked on someone in the room. He was showing us how he got into the person's computer. He got on LinkedIn and he sent an invite to himself from that user. And he said, "Now, should I jump into the the banking app that's loaded on this machine as well? Because I could do that next." And it was it was so eye opening how quick. It is once you're on that bad network. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look look at it this way: endpoints are are one thing, but it, it's you need a you need to break into a lot of them to get the data that you're looking for. Where I think security is needs a higher level focus is within the enterprise because of the way that there's multiple interconnected systems that need to talk and send data back and forth. Um, similar to to like those recent events about that phishing, right? It it's that they need to do a, a you know higher level focus to really in, lower their risk or lower the risk tolerance. I guess like basically what I'm trying to say is you're you're trying to make sure that you're positioning yourself to mitigate those type of risks, but still be able to use the system because if you took the the stance of well, I'm just not going to connect to the internet at all. Well, you're not really going to get very far, right? Um, and, and so, so yeah, there's CISOs have to do this really, really tight balancing act around. Okay, what what am I willing to open up so that um, you know we we can provide a a, a service uh, that is also secure, um, but but also giving end users the best user experience that they can get. Phishing has become one of the largest techniques used by hackers. Yeah, we're not talking about your hobby, HJ, as a saltwater fisherman. No, Max, <laughs> this is fishing with a PH, like the band, fish. You can learn. <laughs> okay. What is phishing and how does Samsung protect against phishing attacks? Yeah, so, so Zach also brought up a, a, a good point the other day. He was talking about zero trust. Um, so, so we, we, as at Samsung, we, 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 that is how we are dealing with, with how we protect individuals from, from phishing. Now, you know, uh, I, we can't control what the end user is doing, but we can at least try to help filter out, uh, those, those type of, um, uh, you know, actions. So a couple of things that we do with, with Samsung Knox uh, and is one, uh, we have domain filtering, which, which can be implemented. 
uh, you know, instead of you know utilizing blacklists, you're now utilizing whitelists. But you have but you have to know where you're going to go. So it, it's sort of like a reactive, uh, you know, type of security implementation. Um, you know, I think it beyond sort of like like the hardware based. You know, we we have software controls that allow us to. Uh, you know, better understand what what people are doing uh, to try to help protect them. And we do that because we we will take hardware devices or mobile devices and we'll connect them into what's known as a mobile device management uh, piece of software. Um, you know, that that that's sort of like the gatekeeper of, okay, let, I know that individuals, you know, you can't necessarily control what they're going to do because a lot of times phishing Praise on emotion or praise on on the the fact that the urgency and or curiosity the curiosity is what gets humans in trouble because they get a text <laughs> message that sounds like it's legitimate it came from somebody who you might know you're like well I trust that person but do you really trust that person to to just send you any type of link and like oh just click this. Um, you know, that's, that's what gets a lot of people in trouble. And that's, that's, so what we do from a hardware side that, that we, you know, we, we try to protect you by implementing those type of controls. Well, is, is it, is it annoying in, in certain cases? Absolutely. Because it's like, well, why can't they just give me access to this? And, and what happens is it, it's, it's there because we're trying to protect you. So I shouldn't click on that text that said, I just want a $50 Amazon gift card. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, the uncle that wants to give you some lottery winnings. Yeah. Please, please, please don't. <laughs> uh, today, uh, everyone refers to AI as the easy button to deal with that all challenges, pretty much, including security. Uh, is Samsung implementing AI in these security solutions to help improve hack detection and mediation? Yeah, so it's 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 kind of interesting. I'm going to bring up Knox one more time because that's that's what Samsung is doing. We're putting all of our security in, into Knox, and one of the one of the ways that that we are um, sort of addressing machine learning, you know, artificial intelligence, is essentially um, securing down the the uh, machine learning and the neural models. And so it, it's a it's a two way um, uh, protection. One of them is 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 because the learning models is critical that uh, you protect that because what can happen is you can have, you know, the, these uh, um, nefarious individuals that want to change the way the output of that neural model gives an answer back to an individual in, in, in a malicious way. And so you need to protect that. And so how do you protect that? Well, you need to first make sure that you're encrypting you know that that model so that it can't be broken into that that's one that's one thing and the other thing is that you know you you also when you're utilizing those those language the, the models on, on the, the device you you have to make sure that that session is secure so think of Knox vault again because now now the the memory is in a session it's only used for that in that purpose and then it's destroyed at the end of it and it goes back into its locked state. And, and you, you can in, in sort of verify that that's happening through, through the use of a secure processor, secure memory, Knox Vault. Uh, we, we have different way, we, we support many different formats. So if you're familiar with like TensorFlow or TensorFlow Lite, you know, PyTorch, there's uh, Onyx, we can support all those models and we, we encrypt it in a certain way where we, we make it generic enough for applications, you know, valid, you know, applications that you want access over to that model uh, to gain access to it. And we'll secure it down utilizing Samsung Knox. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Do companies that already deploy VPNs or SASE need to still be concerned with mobile device security? And what steps would you recommend companies take when deploying mobile devices to ensure strong mobile security? Yeah, so so the you know the endpoints there's so many of them out there. Uh, you know, there's I don't know how many screens I have in front of me right now, but I have a screen here, I have a screen in front of me, I have a screen you know like on my monitor. I mean, it's I there's so many different you know mobile devices that are are in the landscape, and and we're only going to get more. 
It's just a matter of, you know, time and deployment, but for, for SASE based, uh, you know, like sort of endpoints, you have to secure it down. So our approach is secure, manage, deploy, analyze, like those, those are our pillars. And so Samsung, you know, protects you from the moment to make sure that devices are owned by you, like from an enterprise space that you can deploy them out easily. Okay, so take take consumer devices and put them into the enterprise, manage them, meaning put restriction policies in, put in, uh, you know, like analytics in there to, to ensure that your end users, okay, are protected because we might not necessarily be able to be on our A game with security every day because, you know, life happens. Um, and, and so, and we analyze afterwards so that we understand what's going on in, in that space for those mobile devices and, and be able to make proactive changes versus reactive changes. I think that's pretty realistic is anyone who says, you know, my solutions are always going to work. They're always going to protect you. It's, it's a moving, it's definitely a moving target. So that's uh, it's, it's refreshing to hear that that's really the reality we all have to deal with every day. So I wonder what what should we expect from Samsung in the near future from a security perspective? Any new and exciting projects you're not supposed to talk about? <laughs> how, how did I know this this question was going to come up? Uh, I can't uh, resist. I have to ask. Yeah, uh, from a security perspective, we we will always be innovating with security. We will always try to be on the forefront of it. Uh, we always try to be a step ahead um, if we can. Uh, we we need to do the anticipation like. Our, our, our stance is that um, with existing devices in the market space, we're committed to supporting these devices with security maintenance releases. We have a minimum of four years on most of our devices. We're even getting up to um, five years on uh, certain levels of, of enterprise class devices that we have in market. Um, we continually upgrade. We'll, we'll upgrade from the OS perspective to, to really remove out older OSs so that um, you know, we have the better protected additional functionality. From a Knox perspective, we're, we're always trying to really, you know, push the envelope on, on making sure that devices are secure um, for both consumers as well as the enterprise. I mean, that's that's a, a, a key thing that, that we're doing there. But like, but anything, you know, like I, I personally love Samsung devices. Now I'm skating around this a little bit, uh, <laughs> given that, you know, we, we always have, you know, device launches, you know, usually twice a year, but, uh, yeah, I, I can't give you uh, any sort of insight as to what's coming, but I know it's going to be new and exciting. Your your smile says it all. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's something to look forward to for sure. All right. Well, that brings us to game time. So oh, I love this part. I love this part. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> to get to know you a little better, we would like to play a game of this or that. So I will rapidly give you two options and then you just choose the one that best describes you. Okay, but, right. okay. Do I have to wait for all of them or just, just go? Well, I'll give you, I'll just give you two and you choose and go to the next one. Okay. So, all right. Perfect. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Text or call? Text. Walk or run? Definitely run. Drive a car or fly a plane? Uh, fly a plane because I hope to become a private pilot at some point in time in my life. Oh, really? Yes. That's so awesome. Actually, you know, there's a fun fact. When I first met Max, he was studying to get his pilot's license. I was. And he was flying and getting hours in. And then I don't know what happened. He'll blame me. But I, yeah, I think you should go back. <laughs> one day, one day. I feel like one you're going to have to start over. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go right after this in that case. But that's really cool. Do you have <laughs> hours already built up? No, because my wife will never fly in the plane that I fly. So yeah, one day. <laughs> <laughs> Max has tried to convince me to do this with the planes yeah. that have the parachute. So he feels like if we're going down, we'll just hit the we'll chute just... and then we're like gliding somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. This is probably why he hasn't gone back. I had I had a PowerPoint slide around that. It didn't work though. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Cash or credit? Uh, definitely credit. Only because I, I love the points. <laughs> a day of fishing or a day of golf? Uh, fishing because, yep, I love being on the ocean. Cool. Dog or cat? I'm a dog guy. Uber or Lyft? Oh, now now you're putting into me a spot. Ooh, definitely Uber. <laughs> yeah. Super strength or super speed? 
Super speed. Concert or movie? Uh, wait, con- concert or moving? M- movie. Oh, movie. Uh, uh, sorry, concert. That, that's mine. Yep. Okay. Get over it or get even? Uh, <laughs> can I say both? <laughs> I like both. <laughs> city or nature? Uh, definitely the city. Fix a car or fix a drink? Uh, I fix a car because I'm an a- avid renter. So I love, love oh, work. Cool. Sunrise or sunset? Uh, uh, because I can't go for sunrises, sunsets. <laughs> Football or soccer? Soccer. Beach or pool? The beach. Book or movie? Definitely a book. Netflix or Hulu? Uh, is there... No, no, definitely Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> um, buy or borrow? Uh, definitely buy. Task Rabbit or Geek Squad? Ooh, uh, Geek Squad. iPhone or Android? Uh, well, this is a trick question. I mean, <laughs> this is a trick question. <laughs> okay, uh, options. This this one needs a little bit of context, right? Okay, so definitely Android for me. Um, while I do have. Uh, my competitor devices. Um, uh, I just prefer um, being able to have a secure folder, uh, and and so because I have to manage my mom's stuff, who's not very secure with passwords, and so <laughs> so I, I put that on my secure folder. So so that so there is a reason why I do that. But yeah, I prefer Andrew for sure. It sounds like he's Geek Squad for his family, yes. which means we have a lot in common. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> Instagram or Facebook? I, I'm an Insty person. Yep. Mac or PC? Uh, ooh, um, uh, uh, I love them both. They, they, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to say both because I, I okay. love them. I love that each has their own, you know, quirks and, and uh, pluses and minuses. But I, but I do like, I'm very sort of, yeah, agnostic when it comes to that. Okay. Have no Wi-Fi or have no cellular network? I uh, have no Wi-Fi. The TV show, The Deadliest Catch or Wicked Tuna? Oh my gosh. Uh, gosh, I, well, I watched both. How did you know? <laughs> um, uh, wicked Tuna only because I'm from the Northeast and, and I love saying wicked, and, but yeah. I, I lost it from my vocabulary. Is it, isn't, isn't Wicked Tuna the one where they do like spear fishing versus Deadliest Catch? They have like the cages for... Catching I mean, crabs or something like that? The, yeah, Deadliest Catch is all about the king crab or Opelio. Right. Wicked Tuna is all about catching bluefin tuna off of the coast of Massachusetts, like over in, you know, Jeffrey's Ledge. I, I, I'm an avid fan because I love fishing. So that's yeah, <laughs> that's cool. I actually have never seen Wicked Tuna, but I do love the name. I do saying Wicked is cool. <laughs> travel back in time or travel into the future? Uh, travel back in time. Love and laughter or wealth and wisdom? Love and laughter all day. Oh, that's a nice answer. Well, thank you for talking to us today. Yeah, this was thank fun. You. Thank you. Oh, this was fun. Yeah. yeah. To learn more about Samsung Mobile Solutions and how they could be implemented in your enterprise, go to metel.net or contact your Metel sales representative.